On the 14th of October, our friends in the Americas get to see an annular solar eclipse. Whereas two weeks later, on the 28th of October, there is then a partial lunar eclipse. As the Milky Way core disappears into the sunset, we're starting to say hello to the autumn constellations and the autumn Milky Way. Saturn is now past opposition, closely followed by Neptune. And on the 21st of October, we have the peak of the Orionid meteor shower. So if you're getting up early to see the meteors, you may as well capture Venus in the morning sky. So this month's highlight has to be the solar eclipse, the annular solar eclipse on the 14th of October. Now the path crosses the US Pacific coast, travels across the Americas, exits at the Gulf Coast, hits the Yucatan, crosses Belize into Latin America, goes through Colombia, Brazil before ending in the Atlantic Ocean. So it's such a long path all the way through the Americas, the partial phases are pretty much visible from the entire of the American North and Southern continent. So this is an annular eclipse, it isn't a full total solar eclipse. So the disk of the moon doesn't quite cover the whole of the solar disk. So you get this outer portion, this annulus, this ring shape that we can then see. And for this eclipse, this is 95% covered. So you've got that annular shape, that outer ring shape. So please be really careful that even that outer portion is still bright enough to damage your eyes, to damage your camera. So make sure you use the appropriate solar filters or a solar telescope to be able to observe that ring of fire. I'm not too sure why this is the great American eclipse because all eclipses are great, but the fact that it can be seen all the way across North America, all the way through Latin America, South America, means that a large proportion of the Earth's population are actually going to see this eclipse. If you're like me, you're in the wrong continent, then don't forget there'll be live streams broadcasted as the eclipse carries on. So of course, this is pretty much new moon when the moon is directly in line with the sun. I don't think you can have any more new moon than a solar eclipse. So this makes it, of course, the ideal time for deep sky observing. And on that weekend of the 14th of October, while this eclipse is taking place, we have the biggest star party in the UK. This is the Autumn Equinox Star Party at Kelling Heath on the North Norfolk coast. So I'm going to be there. I'm going out with a couple of friends from my astronomy club. So if you are on the red field, then do pop over and say hello. So the main day is the 14th of October. That's when the trade stands are open. That's when the talks are on. And hopefully we'll be able to see that live stream as well from the Americas. And of course, being new moon, being that solar eclipse, that's the time for deep sky observing. Now, in the last video, I said that we should be looking away from the summer Milky Way, looking away from that milky plane of the Milky Way galaxy and looking out across intergalactic space and being able to see those beautiful uh, near galaxies that we've got in Andromeda and in Pegasus. And Anita wrote in to say, no, we should be actually looking at the Milky Way, catching those nebulas, catching those dust clouds that are embedded in the Milky Way. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a quick tour of some of my favourite nebulas that you can get to see at this time of year and I'm going to sneakily throw a galaxy in at the end. So let's start with the Crescent Nebula NGC 688 in Cygnus. Now this is a doom star, this is a wolf Rayet star and they're named after the astronomers Monsieur Wolf and Monsieur Rayet. They were working at the Paris Observatory and they noticed these unusual spectra. And what they are, these are super massive, highly luminous stars. And because they're so massive, the temperatures and pressures inside the core mean they're racing through their fuel in that nuclear fusion. They're burning through hydrogen, going up through the higher elements as well. And they're preparing sometime in the near future, in the next few hundred thousand years, to go supernova. And that tremendous energy, that tremendous uh, power coming out is actually blowing off the outer shells of the stellar atmosphere. So you get this sort of expanding shell uh, going across into space. So the physics inside this star are absolutely staggering. It's 600,000 times brighter than our own sun. It has five times the solar diameter and it's 21 times the solar mass. And in a few hundred thousand years, this will go supernova. We'll be able to see that in the nighttime sky and probably in the daytime sky as well. And with the camera, if you're looking through a telescope, it does take on this sort of crescent shape. It looks to me a bit like the Euro symbol. And visually, it's visible through a medium-sized telescope, an 8 or a 10-inch telescope. But it really does benefit from being under dark skies. And it will really benefit from using a UHC or an O3 filter. Now, sticking in Cygnus, we'll jump across to the Veil Nebula. Now, this is a star that was 
like the Wolf Rayet star, but it's actually gone supernova about 10,000 years ago, a site that was visible to our ancient ancestors. And what we've got then is this expanding shell from the debris, that's a, that stellar explosion. And it's so tenuous that we can only actually see the nebulosity when we're looking around the edge. That's why it's just on the outer parts of that shell. Now, when I was starting deep sky observing, I found this really hard to find. I simply couldn't see it through binoculars or a telescope. And then I realized that you needed to use a deep sky filter. Uh, so a UHV filter or an O3. And now what that does, it only passes through the light from the nebulosity. So it makes the background sky really dark. And that signal to noise ratio is then improved. You can then pick out this faint nebulosity. So there's actually several parts to the veil. And what I do is I start off at Epsilon Cygni. That's a star that forms the wingtip of the swan Cygnus. And then we'll move three degrees southwards down towards 52 Cygni. Now, if you look immediately alongside 52 Cygni through the eyepiece or with the camera, you'll see that long sort of delicate tendril of nebulosity. That's what they call the witch's broom. I think it's an absolutely beautiful sight. And if you jump three degrees across to the other side of the Vale Nebula, you have the long arcing Eastern Porson, that's 6992 and NGC 6995. And again, you'll need a UHC filter or an O3 filter to be able to pick this out. And staying in Cygnus, if you move up towards Deneb, immediately alongside Deneb, you have the North American and the Pelican Nebulas, NGC 7000. Now I've actually observed this with a small refractor while we were at the Kelling Heath star party. It seems quite fitting to include this while there is a solar eclipse taking place across the Americas to then be able to go and see the North America Nebula at the same time. So moving north along the Milky Way, we come to the constellation Cepheus. And here is one of my finds of the season. Now I've been doing this live stacking. This is NGC 7023, the Iris Nebula. Now this is a reflection nebula. It's not shining by its own emitted energy. It's actually reflecting the, night, the light from this nearby star, magnitude 7.4 star. Now visually in the scope, I've always been a bit underwhelmed by the Iris Nebula. It's just a dim glow around that star but doing the live stacking oh my goodness there is so much detail and wonderful features that you can see in this object so well worth checking it out both visually just to detect it and then with the camera or with the live stacking to then be able to build up all these details now if you go to beta andromedae that's almac which is this beautiful double star well worth checking out with the eyepiece and then it's a short star hop to NGC 891. And this is again a telescope that you can see in a medium sized uh, telescope, say an eight or a 10 inch. It's very low surface brightness. So again, you do need to be at a dark sky site. But this is beautiful, absolutely stunning edge on spiral galaxy it's got this embedded dust lane and all this sort of delicate features on it we've done some live stacking with the celestron c11 at f6 and oh my goodness it absolutely blew me away so ngc 891 and the iris nebula have been my finds of the season and as always if we've missed a favorite object or there's something you'd like us to talk about then feel free to put that in the comments section so with the new moon, with the annular solar eclipse happening on the 14th of October, two weeks later, because they always happen in pairs, we have a partial lunar eclipse. Now this is visible from Asia, Africa and Europe and just about touches the maritime provinces of Canada. So it's only a partial lunar eclipse. This is when the moon just clips the Earth's shadow. And what we're going to see, it looks like a bite has been taken out around the sort of southern limb of the moon. So it actually starts at 1802 universal time, but that's the outer parts of the Earth's shadow. That's the penumbral phase. So it's pretty subtle. You probably detect it with a camera, but it's going to be very hard to see by the eye. And the main phase starts at 1935 universal time. And what we'll see then is that bite expanding out from the southern limb. It reaches maximum eclipse at 2014 universal time. And because it's only a partial solar eclipse, the actual main part of the moon is outside of the Earth's shadow. It won't take on that red hue we'll just see that shadow spreading out across the southern limb. The umbral phase ends at 2052 and then the whole eclipse finishes at 2226. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed for some clear skies. What I want to do is take a time lapse to be able to catch that as a video showing that showing the bite being taken out of the moon and then the moon receding away from the Earth's shadow. 
So we have one of the meteor showers of the year this month. This is the Orionids meteor shower. It's predicted to peak on the night of the 21st to the 22nd of October. And typically you'll see about 25 meteors per hour. Now the Orionids is noted for having very fast meteors that often leave a persistent train. So again, leave the camera open, see how many you can capture and enjoy one of the spectacles of the night sky. And interestingly for the Orion is its first quarter moon. So with the radiant rising in the small hours, the moon will have set. So we'll be able to enjoy this without having the moon in the sky. So if you're up early to see the Orion is when that radiance nice and high in the sky, then make sure you swing across to the planet Venus. So Venus reaches greatest elongation on the 23rd of October. That's when it's at 50% phase. And after that, it's then going to start swinging further and further away from the Earth as it prepares to go round the far side of the sun. Now Venus is joined by a beautiful crescent moon on the 10th of October and the star Regulus will be immediately alongside. Jupiter is remaining stubbornly in the morning sky. It doesn't reach opposition until the 3rd of November, so next month. So I've been catching Jupiter either by staying up late or when I've been getting up early for work, catching it in the morning sky before I start the morning commute. So Jupiter is definitely my favorite planet. This is where all the action is. And even in binoculars, you can pick out the small Galilean moons and track them from night to night as they orbit around Jupiter. So at the start of the month, Jupiter's rising about 8 p.m. It's in the constellation Aries, but it doesn't transit until about three in the morning. That's when it's highest in the sky. That's when it's best to be outside doing your high resolution imagery. And I must find this is such an amazing sight. It rotates so fast in only 10 hours. There's always some new feature, some new storm cloud that's rotating into view. Plus, of course, you've got the Galilean moons coming around as well. We've even managed to capture on a night of really good seeing. We've managed to capture surface features on Ganymede. So I always find Saturn to be such a glorious sight. It's well worth hunting down. You'll be able to see, even in a small telescope, you'll be able to see that, that ring system around the planets. And what's been really noticeable as I've been observing it over the last few years is just how narrow those rings are becoming as we prepare to do a ring plane crossing in 2025. Again, with a small scope, you'll be able to pick out the moons and you'll be able to track them from night to night as they orbit Saturn. So we've done some high resolution imagery of Saturn. We've brought out the subtle atmospheric belts and it's on the list of my jobs to process down into video to show you how we turn that video imagery into high resolution imagery. There's not many bright comets around at the moment. We did have comet Nishimura that's now gone around the far side of the sun. And Nick James of the BAA comet section has put this fantastic time lapse together as comet Nishimura has gone round the sun and is now appearing in the solar spacecraft data. This is from the stereo spacecraft data. And you can see the solar particles, you can see the solar wind coming off from the sun and interacting with the comet's tail. If you've got your diary with you, we've got 3rd of November next month, we've got Jupiter at opposition. 9th of November, there is a daylight occultation of the planet Venus by the crescent moon. So I'm gonna keep my fingers crossed for some clear skies and hopefully be able to track that in the morning sky. Venus you can actually see in the daytime, so we'll be able to track that. A couple of weeks after Jupiter is at opposition, Uranus, the planet Uranus, is at opposition on the 13th of November. And then in December, 13th to the 14th of December, we have one of the highlights of the year, the Geminids. This is the king of the meteor showers. This is the one you want to go and see. So we'll keep our fingers crossed again for clear skies. And luckily, a bit like the August Perseids, the Geminids is also at new moon. As for the moon, we've got a last quarter moon on the 6th of October. The 10th of October, the moon is going to gate crash the brilliant planet Venus in the morning sky before dawn. On the 14th of October, we've got that new moon for the annular solar eclipse in the Americas. The 22nd of October, we've got first quarter, which is just in time for the Orionids. So as the moon is setting, the radiant will be rising in the sky. And on the 28th of October, we have full moon for the partial lunar eclipse. So while we're on the moon, Peter commented about the Lunar X short. And he said, in addition to the Lunar X, we should also be looking out for the Lunar V. Now I'm not familiar with this, I actually just quickly searched up what it is. And it turns out to be these two mountain ridges that are running from the crater Eukert 
on the edge of Mare Vaporum. Now it should be visible for some time around either first quarter or last quarter. So see if you can catch this one. It should be visible even in small telescopes. Be interested to know if anyone catches it in binoculars as well. And while you're here, if you've got your telescope set up looking at the moon, see if you can pick out the crater Trisnecker to the south. And it's got this unusual polygon shape. It's not quite circular. But if you look alongside it, you've got all these geological faults, these sort of fissures crossing the lunar surface. And if you look alongside, you've also got the lunar crater Hyginus, and it's got this unusual 220 kilometer long sort of fissure running with a crater in the center of it. Now craters well, throughout the solar system are caused by impacts. They're caused by asteroids, by minor bodies slamming into the surface. But Hyginus here is actually a volcanic caldera. So note, it doesn't have a raised rim. And these darker patches around the outside, they're actually pyroclastic deposits. They're characteristic of the volcanic eruption. And you can also see that fault is the sunken part. It's the surface. The surface is pulled apart and it's then collapsed in the middle. So this region is best seen at first and last quarter. So you've got that big lunar V, those sort of mountain ridges running from the crater Eukert. But you've also got alongside Trisnecker, that Ryle network, and you've got the caldera that, that is not an impact crater, it's a volcanic caldera hygienist with that fault, that graben running alongside. Absolutely wonderful. So I hope you found that useful. As always, if I've missed anything, if there's anything you'd like me to include in the next month, then do let us know in the comments section below. And we'll wish you clear skies, and we'll see you in the next video.